Good morning, our church. Welcome to our On Church Online. It is exciting to be here today. If you're on my watch party, I'm going to look at you right now. Uh, I'm going to say hi to a couple people. Kembra, what's going on? John Whitehead, Kenny Rowan, Ryan Hammerlick, Mike Taylor, Ronnie Barnett. Welcome. Thank you for joining us online. We just want to say thank you to our worship team. They're joining us here on stage. You guys are killing it. You guys did a great job. Thank you so much for leading us into God's presence this morning. We are honored to have you here with us today. If you're at home today and you're, you're starting a watch party and you're doing those things, we want to say thank you so much. Over 7,000 people viewed our services from last week, and that's because of your faithfulness and your willingness to jump on and be the hands and feet of Jesus and we met so many new people because of that. So God bless you, man. God is growing, and God is on the move at our church. And here's the cool thing. He's not just on the move at our church. He's on the move at churches all around the world. The gates of hell will not overcome the church. And thank you so much for being the hands and feet of Jesus, getting the message of hope out to the world. And here's the deal. What we've seen is that what God has been doing is so uncontainable or effervescent. Everybody say effervescent. 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 If you know me, that's one of my favorite words. Um, But last week, uh, what's been happening in this this idea of of effervescing, this series that we're launching today, is off this idea that last week so many people gave their life to Christ. They decided to follow Jesus, and then so many other people decided to recommit their life to Christ and said, listen, I want to be sent to reach people who don't know Jesus with the gospel. And so people have been making these declarations, and when people make declarations of faith, what we've seen is that Satan likes to turn up the heat a notch, you know, right? Satan likes to turn it up a little bit. And so, uh, and, and this is where we have an opportunity to let the faith of God overwhelm our life and not be overwhelmed by the discouragement of Satan in our lives. As a matter of fact, uh, this idea of effervescent faith uh, comes from this word I just say around church all the time, but to effervesce our faith, you know, I brought this soda that I'm going to be opening in just a little bit. Now, if you watched on the service segment, I made it explode. I I, I pray I haven't shaken this up, but if it it is, it's going to be really exciting. But if you know me, and uh, most of you do, uh, our service, I, I love Mountain Dew. Like, there is nothing more exciting for me than when I get a chance to go to the, the, the quick trip, right? And I, I fill this, the, the, the cup up halfway with ice, and then I hit the button that says Mountain Dew, and I watch it just flow and flow and flow into the cup. I, I just sit there sometimes just watching it overflow, effervescing out of the top of the cup. But you know there's nothing more discouraging than when you take that cup and you've, you've said, I'm going to treat myself to a Mountain Dew. And you've been waiting all week, and you go to that fountain, and you press the button, and there's no bubbles in the soda, right? It's flat, right? That's a horrible feeling. There's no worse feeling in the world. We say, I'm going to treat myself to the soda, and the soda is just a sugary drink with no effervescence, Right? And so today, if I opened up this soda, and imagine you were at a conference, and like ever, the, the speaker's speaking, and there's always this one person in the room, and here's what they do. When it gets really quiet, and everybody gets really excited, about, and they're intently listen, they do this. You hear that? And the minute you hear that sound, here's what you know. You want a soda every time. There's never a person in the world that's ever heard that sound of the soda effervescing, blowing up out of the can, and you go, man, a a nice Coke or a nice Mountain Dew would just not be awesome today. Here's the deal. When we read the Bible, and this is what I challenge our church to do, what I challenge you to do at home, is when we read the Bible, what we're going to see is is that before Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, his disciples, he tells his disciples this, that he's getting ready to leave. And they're, gonna, they're not going to have to do life on their own. They're not going to have to muster the courage up on their own. But what's going to happen is that he's going to send them some power. Everybody say power. power. He's going to send them some power. And I'm going to read this passage here. Before we do, we're going to pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. God, we know your word has power in our life. We have seen the evidence of it. God, we ask today that you would move in us in a mighty way. God, that our life would be effervescent for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 
The scripture reads like this. Jesus says this, I'm going to him who sent me. Jesus says, the son is going back to the father. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate or the effervescer, (laughs) right? The advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you and you and you and you. And you, I'll send him to you. This is a very personal promise that Jesus is making to those who follow him, those who believe in him, that if he goes, that he's going to send this, this advocate, this, this one who's going to come into their life and do something extremely special. He's going to send them to you. And in verse 8, it says this, when he comes, not if he comes, but when he comes, he, Jesus will prove, the Holy Spirit will prove to the world that the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about the judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. The prince of this world is Satan. And, and so he stands condemned. And up until now, think about this. The disciples and the believers, they had this opportunity. They could walk with Jesus, and if Jesus did something, they could mimic what Jesus did. If Jesus went somewhere, they could mimic where Jesus went, and they could walk right along with him. But now, instead of that, Jesus saying, I'm going, but something better is getting ready to come into our life. Something better. And instead of having just external access to follow me, you're going to have an internal access and an eternal leader to lead and guide you. I think that's exciting. We see in Acts chapter 1 that right before Jesus ascends, the disciples ask him this question. They say, Jesus, where are you going? And just like a good daddy, guess what he says? None your business. None your business. Tell the person next to you, none your business. I'm going to go see a man about a dog, see a man about a horse, and it's none your business. He, they ask him. He, he, he says, he says, listen, he says, listen, it's, I'm not going to tell you when I'm going. And he says, I'm not going to tell you when I'm coming back. But you will, everybody say will, receive power. Didn't say you might. He's talking to those who believe. He says you will receive power. This word power is the word dunamis. This word means dynamite or dynamic, the same word we get the word dynamite from. I like to put in the word effervescent. You receive effervescent, dynamic power when, and this is important, the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will when you receive. This Holy Spirit is what we call being spirit-filled. So important. And you will, everybody say will, be my witnesses. Can I get a witness? We said that last week. You will be my witnesses. We have a role in this, he says, in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And for us, we hear this and we we don't understand these geographical locations and the, the implications of this. But here's what we see. We see this, that that a believer is spirit filled to be spirit-led witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And here's what he says. He said, you're going to go to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world. Here's what he's saying. Essentially, in these times, there were cultural barriers for people that you shouldn't cross. There were socioeconomic barriers. If you were poor, you really didn't relate with the rich. If you were Jewish, you didn't relate with the Samaritans. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, you will be filled by the Spirit And you'll be led by the Spirit to be witnesses in areas that seemed unreachable. Isn't that awesome? I really feel like that's what happened with our services. Like there's been areas that God has placed upon our hearts to reach our neighbors, to our our family members. And through this right now, like what's happening through this internet service is that people who we couldn't physically go to or didn't have the time to reach the ends of the earth are being able to be reached through this. But he says this, when you get the Spirit, you'll be filled with the Spirit for the expressed purpose to be led by the Spirit. That's so important. There was an effervescent, 
excitement in the local church when they believed in Jesus and Jesus left and the Spirit of God came to live in them. We see that in the book of Acts. Read the book of Acts, right? And, and here's the deal. We know that many people were offended by the faith of those who truly believed that Jesus rose from the dead. We know that because they were murdered. The, the disciples were, were murdered. And they willingly gave their life to share this, this story of the resurrected Savior. And if you're like me, before I came to Christ, I'm just going to get honest with you. Before I came to Christ, when I met somebody who was joyfully excited about Jesus, I mocked them behind their back, and I usually said something lying or snarky to their face. Before I came to Christ, the ways of God, to me, were just silly, right? But now that I've come to Christ, it has changed. My perspective has changed because of what Christ came to do, and he also sent his spirit to live in me so that I could see things like the Spirit sees things. Isn't that awesome? Like before, I was like, oh, what idiots. They believe in this false God, this, va- this invisible God. But now that the Spirit has filled me and lived in me, I can see things like the Spirit sees things. Therefore, I can be Spirit-filled and Spirit-led. And that should, in the life of a believer, produce an effervescent faith. Right? Before... Uh, I, I was scared of people's criticism when I came to Christ. And oftentimes, when we first come to Christ, many of you who first believed and first are following were saying, I'm going to go share the gospel. It's a little bit scary. We totally understand that, right? Because what happens is people are going to probably downplay things at times, our faith and why we believe and maybe that we're weak and that's the reason. But here's the deal. We were not saved to be spirit-filled and spirit-flat. Hear me. You were not saved, and I was not saved, to be spirit-filled and spirit-flat. You know, it's kind of like when somebody tells you they're a believer, but they really don't want to go to church. When they tell you they're a believer, but they really don't believe what the Bible says. When they say that they're a believer, but they really don't love their neighbor. That happens is we don't trust God at his word, but yet we want him to save us. We, are, we might be spirit-filled, but we're spirit-flat. And the world goes, that just doesn't taste good. That's not, that's not satisfying to see somebody spirit-filled, yet spirit-flat. See, God didn't save me to send the spirit of me so that the, the greatest memory of my faith would be just sitting on a, Bible, on, a, on a couch reading my Bible. God wants me to do something with it because he filled me to utilize me so that I would be spirit-led and so that we would be spirit-led. And so over the next few weeks, what we're going to do, we're going to break down what a spirit-fueled, Christ-like character looks like. It's so important. A spirit-fueled, Christ-like character. And if you're new, this is going to rock you. But I'm going to tell you, if you've been following Jesus for a while, this is going to rock you too because this is something that we always need to be reminded for, especially because we're in a time in our life right now that we've never been in. I've had frustrations because of being at home with my kids for excessive amounts of time that I have not chose to be spirit-led in some moments. Amen? Come on now. I got some moms and dads on the stage. I've said some words louder than I would like the neighbors to hear. I've been frustrated a little bit more. Like the house gets dirty so fast right when you just clean it. And so I know in the season that we're in, we need to be spirit-filled. We need to be spirit-led. And there needs to be a fruit of the spirit in our life. And that is exactly what we're talking about today. And Here's what I know. That when we're spirit-filled and spirit-led, it will be liberating for us. It will be liberating for us because it will bring us to be closer to be the people that we know that God's called us to be. It will bring us closer to becoming the people that we know deep down in our hearts we should be. And it will bring us closer to becoming the people that our kids desire to be parented by. Our brothers and sisters desire to hang out with. Less expecting from them and more us just giving love and sharing love. Less hurt and more forgiveness. So today, we're going to look at Galatians chapter 5. And this part of scripture leads us to where we're going to learn about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. The fruit in the original Greek is the word karpos. K-A-R-P-O-S. Now, I like fishing, so I think of carp. This is good stuff. And so the karpos, this means the result of something. The fruit of the Spirit is the result of being spirit 
filled and spirit led. It should produce a result. You know, you know, an apple tree is known by its fruit. If, if somebody says that's an apple tree, but it has oranges, guess what it is? It's not an apple tree. <laughs> it's an orange tree, right? Right. And so the fruit identifies the tree. We look at the fruit and we go, yep, that sure is an apple tree. And then here's what we do. We look at the fruit and we go, mmm, that's not very good fruit. That fruit looks dead. We're not going to eat that fruit. And then we see other trees where the fruit looks incredible. You ever come up in the, I'm walking around in the, in, in, in the fields. My grandpa, and when we were older, he had these fields. And we'd walk around. And he had this fence row. And on this fence row was these grapes that would grow on this fence row. And you get the grapes at the right time of the year. You put them in your mouth. And, oh, there's never been, a, I've never tasted a grape like that in a store ever in my life. And you knew that when you're, you didn't even know if, if raccoons pooped on it or birds pooped on the fruit. Only thing you knew is that when you popped that fruit in your mouth, that it was good fruit. And it was exciting to consume. And we want to have a fruit in our life. The, the result of God being in our life should be something the world is excited to consume from us. And so we, we want to see that. And the result of the Holy Spirit is a fruitful character that produces an effervescent faith. Everybody say effervescent. effervescent. Tell your neighbor at home, the person next to you, scream it across the couch, Effervescent. Just try it. It actually feels good. It like bubbles out of you. Like it'll become a normal part of your vocabulary. And so today we're going to ask three fruitful questions to sustain an effervescent faith. The questions that believers, those who aren't believers, they need to ask themselves. I promise we ask these questions to ourselves. What's going to happen is we are going to grow. The first question that we need to ask is, will I, everybody say will I, leverage my freedom to destroy my sin. Will I leverage my freedom in Christ to destroy my sin of my own flesh? The Bible says that if we're actually going to live our life out, that we actually have to take the plank out of our own eye to help take the speck out of my brother's eye, right? You know what a speck is? It's just a small little splinter, right? It's just a shard of that big plank that's sitting in your own eye. Right, But we got to take that out. And he says when we do that, we can then see fit to help our brother out. But here's the thing. We have to, before God, we have to leverage our freedom in Christ to destroy the sin in my life. See, it's my sin that mutes my effectiveness for God's kingdom. It's my sin that takes away the bubblies, that makes my faith go flat. Right? It's my sin, but it's the Holy Spirit in my life, act of my life, me leading him, me being led by him, being filled by him that produces the effervescent faith. Here's verse 13. Paul is saying to the church of Galatia, says, you, my brothers and sisters, and I love this because these were not perfect church people. We think the people in the Bible were perfect and we are sinners. No, these guys messed it up. These were not, and, and Paul comes to them in love and he says, hey, you, my brothers and my sisters, you were called to be free. Everybody say free. But do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Flesh is another word for sin. It's another word for the opposite of what God wants for us to live by. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. See the balance there? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Don't learn how to love yourself so you can love your neighbor. It's like, hey, let's just start loving myself and my neighbor at the same time. We think we have to get us good. We think we have to get ourselves fixed. You can't fix yourself. I can't fix myself. I can just surrender myself into God's care and ask him these, these questions. Am I willing to leverage my freedom to destroy my sin. Love your neighbor yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroying each other. See, here's the deal. What we sow into is what we will reap. What we sow into is what we will reap. If we sow selfishness, we'll reap destruction because we'll be all by ourselves. And there's nothing worse than being by yourself. The Bible says, a man who seeks isolation seeks destruction. Paul says, you know what's better than sinning? I love this. 
serving others humbly. He says, you really want to love yourself well? Start serving other people. You know what's better than sinning? Serving. And instead of serving my flesh, which will never be satisfied, I always want something bigger, better, faster, more exciting. He says, I'm going to serve my neighbors. I'm going to serve my community. And I'm going to serve the believers in Christ. Love your neighbors as yourself. And he says this. Here's the, key, here's the key to all this. This is not possible without that. He says, so I say, walk by the Spirit. Imagine you walking down a road, and the Spirit's just next to you at every step you take. And, and you, you're just trying to keep in step with him. Because I want the Spirit. I want to be with the Spirit. I'm going to be walking with the Spirit. He says, walk by the Spirit, so you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. See, well, lot of times I just keep trying to tell myself no, keep trying to tell myself no, but I never replace it with anything healthy. He says, here's how you replace it with something healthy. It's not another habit. It's a lifestyle change of staying in step with the Spirit. But you've got to ask yourself this question. Am I willing to leverage my freedom to destroy my sin? He says, here's this, for the flesh desires what is contrary or opposite of the Spirit. And the spirit desires what is contrary or opposite of the flesh. And they are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. What happens is is when we stay in step with the spirit because we want to be in the spirit's presence, right? We're not doing it out of a legalistic thing. I'm not checking the box saying, I got to do this. I can't sin today, can't sin today, can't sin today. What you're saying is, I'm going to follow Jesus today. I can't wait to walk with Jesus, see where he leads me today. And you start walking with the Spirit. Paul says there's this invisible war between what your flesh desires and what your spirit desires. It's invisible. But deep down, you know it's there. You know why? Because we all want other people to think of us as good people. Right? People tell me all the time, I'm a good person. Well, tell me why, right? Well, I helped out my buddy the other day. Awesome. Really cool. That's nice. Very cool. Doesn't make us a good person. Because good in the Bible means perfect. And God says none are perfect, not one. And so we want people to think of us as good. We want people to think of us generous. We want people to think of us as outstanding and upstanding contributors to our society. But deep down, when we are walking in our flesh, what we really want is more me time. Time to do my hobbies. Time to do the things I want to do. So I rush through the things that are really important. Spending time with my kids. Doing this thing around the house. Speaking life into people. Sharing the gospel. Right? So I can get back to my hobby. So I do it, but I'm checking the boxes. I'm going through the motions. Well, I read my Bible today. Okay, God, you can stay in that corner. But then I'm not walking in the Spirit in every area of my life. And God says, well, I, Paul says, they're in conflict with each other. But deep down, we want other people. So we post the good pictures on social media. right? We, Instagram has the perfect filter. It has all that stuff, right? But deep down, we, we want more me time. We want... We, we're scared to give faith-sized amounts, right, to where we actually have to trust God to, 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 keep for, to do for us, right? We want our neighbors to think well of us when we threw the stick in the yard when they weren't looking. We want them to think we're the good neighbor or threw the dog poop over the fence, right? But Paul says, here's the deal. This struggle is real. That's why I'm talking about it. He's not sharing this to make us feel bad about ourselves. He's sharing this to ex- so we can know and be honest with ourselves. The struggle is real, but here's the deal. The spirit has more power than the flesh if you walk with the spirit. See, it already has more power, has more potential power, but God doesn't force himself on people. And so we stay in the person. So here's what I want you to do. Now, I want you to tell the person next to you, the struggle is real, but the spirit has more power. That's right. And this week, I know this because I have a daughter named Paisley. She's my little munchkin. And Paisley got Easter candy. Anybody get Easter candy? Anybody's kids get Easter candy? And uh, Paisley had this rule. You could keep the candy bucket in your room if you didn't have any candy in your bed at bedtime. And she said, Mommy, I would never do that. So I had the privilege of getting put in her to bed. We read a Bible story on the Bible app on Version. If you don't have it, download it. It's awesome for your kids. We played the game at the end. Uh, the kids beat me, which is not normal because I don't like to lose on purpose. And so, and so uh, they, they beat me, and I put Paisley to bed. She went to the restroom. She did all the things we did. And she comes back to bed, and I go to tuck her in, and she smells like chocolate. And I said, Paisley, 
Why do you smell like chocolate? I want some more chocolate, are you? I'm like, you're chewing chocolate. No, I'm not. I would never do that. Mommy told me I couldn't have candy in my bed. So I started looking around her bed because I'm smelling chocolate, and I think I'm going crazy. And I get to this pillow, and she panics. And she panics. She actually outed herself. She says, Daddy, there's chocolate in that pillow, and there's a pocket in the pillow I didn't even know about. She could have got by on me, but her conviction overwhelmed her, and she says, Daddy, it's in there. And I took it out, and there was a half chewed on and licked on chocolate Easter bunny. But guess what? Her flesh, even though she knew what to do, she knew what to do. She decided to walk in the flesh and, and desire and to go after, right? But here's the deal. We are all like that little kid. We're all like my little kid. We've all gone after things and chased after things that we knew that wasn't going to feed our soul, that wasn't going to make us an upstanding person. But then we tried to portray to the world that we were upstanding. We have temptations. The struggle is real, but the power of the Spirit is bigger. And so Paul doesn't minimize this war. That's this cool thing. He really talks to people. He says, guys, this war is real. If you, if, you, if you minimize it, you're in trouble. He doesn't minimize it, but he says, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Essentially, he's saying, stay busy pursuing this presence of God in your life and the leading of God in your life. And so we are here as on, the, on this earth to leverage our freedom for the sake of good. The second thing is the question that we have to ask, second fruitful question is this. Am I honest about the temptations of my own flesh? If we're going to walk in the Spirit, we've got to ask this. Am I honest about the temptations of my own flesh? Because Paul says the acts of the flesh are obvious. We know Satan's weapons, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfishness, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. That last one gets me. And the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this, or those who have their path set to live this way, not those who've made mistakes, because Paul's talking to people who's made mistakes, but those who've chosen that this is the path of their life will not inherit the kingdom of God. And the culture screams out, and even believers today are screaming this out because they're not walking in the Spirit. You do you. They'll look at you destroying your life, and they'll say weird flex, but okay. Right? But Paul says, obviously, that is not being spiritually fruitful. Being spiritually fruitful is when we're so honest that we can continually ask the Spirit of God to keep us from evil and help us to resist evil and to walk in step with the Spirit. When we're honest about our temptations, we'll be honest about that we truly still need God's guardrails in our life. When we're not honest about our temptations, we minimize God's guardrails. God, I don't need you to tell me what to do. I don't want you to tell me what to do. But we're honest, we won't. And Paul was honest about his temptations, that if his spiritual walk was going to be, if he's going to plant churches and reach nations, that he needed to be honest. And so before Kim and I got married, we, 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 we were Christians, and we made some commitments to put some guardrails in our life to protect the marriage bed, the sanctity of the marriage bed. That number one, we would never go alone to have lunch with a person of the opposite sex, no matter who they were, no matter what age they were. That we would have no secret conversations with the opposite sex. Everything is open. That my wife and I would have access to each other's passwords and accounts, except my wife has a secret close card. That's what happens, right? That the trips with our friends, if they were going to compromise morally on the trip, we were not going to have anything to do with that trip. We are going to love them from a distance, but we didn't want to put ourselves in temptation's way. And when we read this passage, we realize that the line of acceptability we think is right here. Like, don't touch somebody. You can look as long as you don't touch. But Jesus says the line's back here. He says, don't look, but look at me. Don't touch, but, but the line back here is in our heart, our soul. And if we're not honest about what our soul and our heart and our flesh is craving apart from God then we're not going to ask him to deliver us from it. And Paul was so honest, he said this, I die to myself daily, daily. Why? Because he knew that the thoughts were going to come back again, and he had to push them out by the power 
of the Spirit, that he had to be honest. Paul knew that there was a war inside of him. And here's the deal. If we're 50% honest, you get 50% freedom, and that's still bondage. 50% honest equals 50% freedom, and that is still bondage. And so I have to ask myself this question, man, am I honest about the struggles of my own flesh, right? And then ask God to deliver me from them. And the third question that I need to ask, the final fruitful question I need to ask to maintain my spiritual effervescence, I love this, is am I truly able to identify heavenly fruit? Am I truly able to identify and say, that looks like Jesus. That looks like the Spirit of God active in somebody's life. Today we call good bad and bad good. We, we've reversed the roles. We call abortions liberating and we call abstinence unrealistic. Eagle eggs are federally protected, but unborn children are not. We live in an upside down world. And the Bible says that we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, which means we start to ask God to see things the way he wants them done. His will on earth, not my will on earth as in heaven. Today, Paul, in verse 22, Paul narrows the focus of this upside down world. And he says this, if you want to identify fruit, here is what fruit looks like. The fruit of the spirit, the result of spirit led living is love. What? What? Peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He says, if you want to see fruit, that's what it looks like. That's good fruit. That's fruit you want to consume. This is what you want to invest your life in. This is eternal. This is what's going to be in heaven. The other stuff will be burned in the fire, the Bible says. This is what makes it to heaven. Love, joy, peace, forbearance. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And he says, listen, and against these things, there's no law or there's no limitation. If you want to know more of that, ask God for it. He'll give it to you. He might not give you more cars, right? But if you want more of that, he'll give it to you. Notice the fruit of the Spirit wasn't self-pride and self-esteem, which what we're told is a fruit of the Spirit today. It wasn't sexy legs or a big muscular butt. It wasn't early retirement or residual income. It wasn't a new car or a successful business. It had nothing to do with sex, drugs, rock and roll, friends with benefits, Netflix and chill, or a wonderful stimulus check. That was not the fruit of the Spirit. He says, but you will bear fruit if you walk in the Spirit, and the fruit will help you do what Acts 1.8, what we read in the beginning, commissioned us to do. And that is go to be a witness to the nations, to witness to people who currently don't know Jesus and don't believe. That is why we were saved to be sent. We were redeemed to be repurposed for his kingdom. And there is no way that, that those far from God will want their life the way it is once they've tasted of good fruit. See, those who belong to Christ, the Bible says, have, everybody say have, crucified the flesh. We kill the flesh. Flesh, you don't matter anymore. My soul matters. And they crucified this flesh with its passions. You desired raunchy things before. You desired unethical things before. Gone. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. And if we have not crucified the desires of our flesh, we will not fully live into the virtues of the Spirit and turn from the vices of our flesh. And so here's the thing. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Just want to talk to the church, man. If you're home, just close your eyes. I want you to question. Here's the deal. We all have vices, yet we all desire God's virtues to be recognized by the world in our life. For some, your vices are secret right now. You're getting out of control with some of the things that are going on in your life, but you've got it manageable, and it's secret right now. God wants to come in the middle of that situation, and he wants a spirit to lead you out of that. For others, your vices are no longer secret. They're so out of control. You've lost so much. And God says, I still love you, and I still want to be the center of your life, and I want to lead you to a spirit-filled and spirit-led life. And there will be a testimony 
because of what everybody witnessed before and what they witnessed today. For others of you, you're at the tipping point. You could start back into sin. You said yes to Jesus. And you could be bitter. You could be frustrated. You could bring back that unforgiveness. You could take the lust back into your, your system again. Or you could turn for the kingdom and you could spare yourself the pain of what that bears. God says, turn today. And then there's others who have been following Jesus for a long time. And that last part where it says, do not become conceited, provoking, or envying each other. What happens is we can get involved in church and we can be churchy and religious. And then other people get promoted and we get upset or something else happens and we don't get control over that. Right? Or we have a wisdom and an insight, but we become graceless and we become judgmental and and angry towards others because they're not doing what we want them to do or not doing what we see. God wants to bring you in back to a place of grace, show you how much he loves you, and he wants to pour out his spirit on you so that we would go out to a world that doesn't know him and share the hope of Jesus. We all have flesh. And if we walk away from the spirit's leading, here's the deal, we could crumble at any moment. And Jesus knew that, and yet he knew we were also not meant to carry the weight of the spirit alone. So he came and sent an advocate. And so our faith would have an everlasting, dynamic, effervescent power, which can only come from God's spirit. He wants to turn your pain into purpose. He wants to replace your sin with a savior. And he wants us to respond today to the gospel by leveraging my freedom to destroy my sin, by getting honest about my own personal temptations so I can be delivered from it, and to learn to quickly appreciate and identify heavenly fruit in myself and those around me. And when we do good, God will teach us how to apply this so we can become witnesses to a nation. God wants to transform us first inside so we can bring transformation to a world outside. Now, here's the thing. If this is your first time logging on today, I want to invite you to come back. We're going to talk about these virtues one by one as we go through the next couple weeks. I want you to commit. I'll be back. And you're saying, hey, listen, I'm going to be on next week. I want you to put on the, in the text right there, I'll be back. Just put, I'll be back, which means you're going to be back next week to log on with us. If you're here today and you're thinking, man, I need God's spirit in my life. I want to have the power to live that life out. I want you to know you don't get it by working harder, by becoming more religious. You get it by surrendering your life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and asking him for the ability to give you the power to walk with him. And if you haven't asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, it's not hard. God knows what you've done. He wants to forgive it. But we have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he lived a sinless life, that he rose again from the dead like we talked about last week, and that if we place our faith in him, he will come live in us and forgive us. And wash us clean from all of our sin, internally and externally, past, present, and future. And he'll empower us to walk in his freedom. If that's you today, you're at home saying, I want the love of Jesus in my life. I want to be forgiven for my sin. I want to know what true fruit looks like. I want you to bow your heads and pray. Say this right now. Say, Heavenly Father, I've sinned, but I desperately need a Savior and a Lord. And he is Jesus. I place my faith in him. And him alone, come live in me and through me, through the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to bear your fruit and walk in step with you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for tuning in today. Thank you guys for being with us here on the stage. And I want to turn it back over to Amy. Have a great Sunday. God bless.